Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Cadet Third Class Michaela Conkle. Welcome to the 28th Annual National Character and Leadership Symposium. It is my privilege to welcome to you our guest and speaker, Major DJ Skelton. After enlisting in the U.S. Army, DJ served as a Chinese interrogator. He later attended the United States Military Academy at West Point, where he went on to commission as an infantry officer. In November of 2004, while leading a rifle infantry platoon during close combat in Fallujah, Iraq, he was severely wounded. Leveraging this experience, he went on to write Our Hero Handbook, a guide for wounded service members on their journey to recovery. He has served in multiple positions, such as a military advisor to Deputy Secretaries of Defense, Paul Wolfowitz and Gordon England, as well as Special Assistant to the Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff. He served as a non-resident military fellow at the Center for a New American Security, leading the Silent Wounds Project on post-traumatic growth for the Center. Finally, DJ is fluent in Chinese and one of the youngest graduates of Harvard's Senior Executive Fellowship Program, a graduate of Stanford University's GSB Ignite Program, and founder of the nonprofit Paradox Sports. After retiring from active duty, he is currently a Special Assistant to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present to you Major Retired DJ Skelton. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. And thank you to the Air Force Academy for once again hosting this incredible symposium by inspiring the next generation of Air Force and citizen leaders. In 2004, I was just over a year out of graduating the United States Military Academy. And I was a second lieutenant, signed as a platoon leader in a rifle infantry unit. We had deployed in the second wave in the, the battle in Iraq. <clears throat> and a little over one month after arriving in Iraq, I was leading a combat patrol during the second battle of Fallujah and my platoon was ambushed. About a month later, I woke up out of an induced coma at the Walter Reed Army Hospital here in Washington, DC. You know, one of the key tenets of being a warrior <clears throat> is focusing on the mission. And in the army, we like to say, I will always place the mission first. But which mission do you place first? And, who, and, and I didn't understand at that time when I was lying in a hospital that in fact, my mission had changed. You see, in my mind, as I was laying there recovering, all I could think about is all I needed to do was get out of the hospital, get on a plane, get back to Iraq so I could continue the mission. And that mission, in my mind, was to continue leading my soldiers in battle. Over the course of two years, I went from being an inpatient to an outpatient and conducted several dozen surgeries. I had lost my left eye. I had lost the use of my left arm. I, my eye was an exit wound. And I had a bullet and shrapnel that went through the right side of my face, through the mouth and up through the upper jaw. And so while I was in the hospital, I didn't have the ability to see out of my left eye. Both of my arms were being operated on. My right leg was being operated on and I couldn't communicate. And I spent that time just focusing mentally on figuring out ways that I could get back to my unit so I could continue leading. What I didn't realize is I failed to realize that my mission had changed. And instead of focusing it on me and trying to figure out what I needed to focus on, I did everything I could to escape out of that hospital and to get back to my unit and do whatever I needed to do to convince the army to put me back into the infantry and rejoin my troops. When I left the hospital, I had to go back to the rear detachment unit in Fort Lewis, Washington where I was stationed. My troops were still, my soldiers were still downrange in Iraq. And when I got there, the army, the institution, the organization had a process. 
to determine whether or not I, as a wounded veteran, as a wounded soldier, was capable, was mentally and physically fit enough to return to battle. And when I went through that, it was the first time in my life that I was being told that I was not fit for duty. And in fact, how I interpreted what I was being told was that I was of no value and of no purpose to this organization and institution that I loved and I served. And I was still trying to fulfill this mission of returning to my troops so I could continue to lead them. The reality was I could barely walk. I was in a, a wheelchair for most of that time uh, when I was going through the medical evaluation board process. I couldn't use my left arm or left hand at all. And all I could think about was trying to get back. And so from there, I continued for the next five years doing whatever it took so I could stay in uniform so I could continue to make my way back to the infantry to my unit. During that time, because I was so focused on where I was at the time that I was severely injured, all I could think of that about was all I needed to do was get back to where I was. And for me, I had understood resilience to be just that. And in reality, I would never be able to get back to where I was. I had these permanent physical limitations now that I hadn't spent time to address. And instead of reprioritizing my mission in life to focus on me and rebuilding me to a point where I could assume my new normal and I could understand and achieve my new thresholds of what was possible and what I was capable, both mental and physical, I was never going to truly understand where I was in life at that time. And because I couldn't be true to myself, it impacted almost everything around me. And so I learned the hard way over the course of five years, which is, it took me to rehab and recover to get back to uh, the infantry, which I'll talk about in a minute. I learned that you always have to place the mission first, but sometimes the mission changes. And in this case, it was changed not because of me, not because of the institution or organization that I was serving in, but because of, of just this happenstance of life, the enemy got to weigh in, right? And one thing that I'll talk a little bit later about is another tenet of warrior ethos, which is the value of relationships. And in this case, the enemy got a vote. They were part of the equation. And so I remember I was given an opportunity to go to the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California, about five years after I was severely wounded. It wasn't what I wanted. I was allowed to company command, but it wasn't in the infantry. And it was in a training school. And I was a little bitter about that. But it was the only opportunity that I had if I wanted to stay in the military. And I remember five years after being wounded, 60 major surgeries later, I remember getting up, putting my uniform on to go to work and looking in the mirror and I broke down and started crying. It was the first time I looked in the mirror and I thought to myself, wow, I don't have an eye. I'm missing my left eye. I don't have use of my left hand. With no depth perception and no ability to hold a rifle, what am I thinking that I'm gonna to return to the infantry and continue being a soldier and continue being a leader within the infantry, which is what I wanted to do when I was in the academy, which is what I wanted to do. And I actually got my first choice <laughs> at branch night. And it was my first introduction that I got to understand that the mission isn't necessarily what the army's mission was, but we have multiple missions in this life. And so in order to be true to yourself so that you can be the best version and you can maximize the capability that you have as an individual, as an individual leader, 
that you all are going to become. You have to prioritize where you are in life and which of those missions needs to come first. Otherwise, there was really no chance for me to succeed. What happened when I stood in front of that mirror is I realized that I wasn't able to manage the expectation of the reality of where I was and what I had to offer. And that was the second aspect of what my understanding of the warrior ethos was, which was learning how to manage expectations. Another tenant in the Army's warrior ethos is I will never accept defeat. Well, how do we define defeat? I defined it as having a certain rank or a title or a position. I define defeat as if, if I define success as having to go back to exactly where I was at this moment that I was wounded and then pick up as if nothing had happened, as if I had not been wounded and then continue my career. And the reality was I wasn't the same physically or mentally as I was when I was that young Lieutenant straight out of the Academy. I actually acquired new limitations that I hadn't quite understood or accepted, but I was pretty persistent. And it, about eight years, seven years after I was wounded, I had an opportunity to go down to Fort Benning, Georgia, back to the home of the infantry and to test my body, to see if I was capable after dozens of surgeries, if I could go back out onto the battlefield. And the Army gave me an opportunity to return to an infantry unit that just happened to be deploying to Afghanistan. I couldn't have been more excited. And I jumped on a plane after I, I went through my schooling again at, at Advanced Infantry Command School. And I showed up to Germany, got all my equipment, went to Afghanistan. I took command of a, of a rifle infantry company. And I'll never forget, I was on my second mission as the company commander. And we were down in Panjway Horn of Afghanistan. This is 2011 now. This is seven years after I was severely wounded. I still don't have an eye. I have no depth perception. I don't have use of my left arm. And I just figured it out. I figured out how to convince the army that I could do this. And we were out on a patrol and halfway through the patrol, we got ambushed. And at that point I realized I needed to take a knee. And if you can imagine that scared, that scared me quite a bit. Luckily I was surrounded by really amazing soldiers that took care of me. And at that moment I realized that I had failed to manage my own expectations of what I was capable of doing. You see, time, money, and compassion are all finite resources. And as much as we want to believe that we can do anything we wanna do and we can accomplish anything we want to accomplish, the reality is, is what it is we're capable of accomplishing will define and help us manage the expectations of what's in the realm of possibility. We talk a lot about self-help and we talk a lot about mental well-being and making sure that just as much as we can evaluate our physical strength, we need to take time now to figure out ways to evaluate what our mental capacity is. This whole time from 2004 to 2011, after I was wounded and now I'm company commanding back in a combat zone, now in Afghanistan, I had never once taken the time to fully understand what my limitations were. Because in my mind, by even acknowledging that I wasn't strong enough, that I wasn't physically capable or mentally stable enough, 
to manage the rigors of leadership, let alone the rigors of leadership in combat. I wasn't aware of the fact that I was not only putting myself at risk, but the lives and the soldiers around me. And so learning how to manage expectations was something that I then focused on after that experience. I came back from Afghanistan. The first phone call I made was to the infantry branch of the army and said, hey, thank you so much for letting me do this. I quit. This is stupid. This is not smart. I am finally ready to say I'm not able. My body is not able to function in these environments. Luckily, the Army came back then and said, well, luckily you have other assets that we need. Would you be willing to work over here? And it just so happened to be as a foreign area officer focusing on US-China relations. The other thing that I learned throughout this time of recovery was I wasn't alone. I was surrounded by people. I belonged to multiple communities. I had my family, I had my friends. I had friends from hobby groups. I loved to rock climb and ski. And because I couldn't be honest with myself, I couldn't be honest with those that were around me and tell them what my limitations were. That's a hard thing to accept. I suffered from both PTSD and TBI. And even to this day, I, I have trouble with memory, with short-term memory. So I forget names. I forget that I'm supposed to call people back. I forget uh, just some basic things. Luckily, there's a lot of tools out there to help me improve and get better. But during that chapter of my life, I, I hadn't accepted the fact that I needed help. And so the people that are around me that were standing by to help, I wasn't able to tell them that I was ready to accept help because I wasn't aware that I needed help. And the first couple times that I decided to test out calling people or calling an organization that said they had a resource, I was kind of let down. Which brings me into the third and last aspect of what I think is a paramount foundation for a warrior is to surround yourself, not just with strong relationships, but with trusted relationships. Relationships are key, but again, time, money, and compassion are finite resources. And so at the time that I need help, it's probably at a time that I need a resource to help me sooner than later. And so who can you turn to that you can pick up a phone and you know that the person on the other line is going to pick up or they're going to answer the door? Several years ago, uh, back when I was in Monterey, one of my soldiers, I had come home and a former soldier of mine from a previous assignment showed up at my doorstep. My son was two years old. And he was laying on a couch on my front porch. We brought him inside. He didn't have a place to stay. He had turned to a bunch of, of organizations for help. And he found himself homeless in a tough spot in life. For the next six months, that veteran ended up sleeping. We had a small two bedroom place. He ended up sleeping with my two year old son in his bedroom in the separate bed. And we spent the next six months cleaning him up, trying to figure out what resources he needed, getting him connected to those that owned the resource and then getting him back in his feet. I was honored that he knew that we had, during the time that we had served together, 
that we had a relationship that he knew that he could trust that he could come over to my house in the middle of the night and ask for help. And the reality is at no time that he was with me, did he ever actually physically say, I need help. When I look back at my recovery and real rehabilitation after I was wounded, I wasn't strong enough to ask for help. I wasn't strong enough to not turn to alcohol. I wasn't strong enough to stop taking pain meds and opioids that were so readily available as a wounded warrior. But every single time that I struggled, my battle buddies, my mentors, my professors, my comrades, my ski buddies, my climbing partners, showed up, picked me up, pointed me in the right direction, and supported me. And I learned through this experience that trusted relationships were the key to ensuring that when we have setbacks in life, whether it's not getting the job that you want, falling out of a relationship, getting divorced, suffering loss in our life, being severely wounded, being raped. You can't just turn to anybody because they may not have the time or the compassion needed to help us. But if you surround yourself and you invest in being a leader that, that really understands and and, and appreciates the effort that it takes to build trusted relationships with the people that we surround ourselves with, both on and off the battlefield, both in and out of uniform. Then when you find yourself, like I did, not strong enough to wake up and address the challenges of the day when you're dealt a pretty, a pretty rough hand, you're okay because your support base around you is there and they'll help pick you up. I didn't have the opportunity growing up to participate in a conference like this. And so, especially at such an important stage in your leadership development, to be introduced to so many resources and, and examples of positive examples of what right looks like to put in your leadership rucksack. And so I'm a little envious that as you start out on this journey, you get to hear about all these different stories through different lenses from all walks of people, from all walks of life. There is no cookie cutter approach to how to be a good leader. You're gonna to have to own it. And each one of you has your own strengths and weaknesses in this life. Spend some time to understand what you are capable of, and more importantly, figure out what you're not capable of. Understand your own limitations. Bring people into your life, but identify those that you connect with and, and identify those that you want to be a part of your trusted network. And words matter. So when you tell somebody, we're never gonna leave a fallen comrade, we have to fulfill that promise. I have no doubt that our nation is in great hands with all of you 
It's the next generation of leaders standing by, ready to take on the hard work of sustaining and protecting our democracy. I'm humbled and honored to have had this opportunity to just be a small part of your journey in this thing we call life for however long the duration. I've been dealt some pretty hard challenges in my life, both professionally, leading the platoon of infantrymen during the second battle of Fallujah, to going to the Pentagon to help him change the course of how we as a Department of Defense manage and provide resources and help improve the lives of our wounded, our military and their families, and how we help them transition back home when they can no longer serve. And although my road was a little bumpy, the education that I got at another premier leadership institute over at West Point <clears throat> and the mentorship that I got from past generations of leaders prepared me, even though I might not have seen it, for some of the hardest um, roadblocks that one could have in life. And so I have no doubt that as you look forward and you look at what it is that you want to accomplish and what you want to do in this life, I have no doubt that you will have all the resources available to you. And you have a cadre of us standing by to help mentor and, and point you in the right direction. I especially want to thank the cadets of Kayla Steiner and Brian Augustine from the Air Force Academy here for all your hard work and patience in working with me the past few months. And again, to the Air Force Academy for hosting this much needed leadership and character symposium, inspiring the next generation of Air Force citizen leaders. God bless.